So the last talk this afternoon will be by Jörg Biderman. And uh, I mean, uh, he will talk about higher ships. So Jörg, it is yours now. You can go. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this nice meeting and for inviting me. Um, uh, this is joint work with Mathieu Anel, Eric Finster, and André Joyal, and uh, the results that I'm going to talk about are in this, in this preprint, higher sheaves and left exact localizations in infinity topper. It's available on the archive. Uh, some related results are in this other article, Modalities in Homotopy Type Theory by Reike, Schulman, and Spitters. Okay, so let me start by recalling some facts about one topoi. So, if you have a small category C and you take pre sheaves with values and sets, that's a one topos. And every one topos is the left exact localization of such a pre sheaf topos. And then it's true that any left exact localization of a pre sheaf topos corresponds bijectively to a Grotendieck topology on C. So any left exact localization is given as the sheafification with respect to this Grotendieck topology. And then there is also this set theoretic uh, thing that in, in, uh, in a one topos, any left exact localization is accessible. Okay, now I'm going to infinity topoi. So when I, so C is now an infinity one category, and usually I will just say category. And S is my notation for the category of infinity groupoids. And I will basically just say the category of spaces and an object I will call a space. Uh, it's modeled by by the by uh, uh, topological spaces up to up to weak equivalences or by simplicial sets, for example, up to weak equivalences. And then again, we have the basic fact in infinity topos theory that if we take uh, a small category C uh, and then we take pre sheaves on that with values in the category of spaces, well, that's an infinity topos. Okay. And then it's still true that uh, every infinity topos is the left exact localization of such a pre sheaf topos. Okay, here I have to say accessible. There might be things that are inaccessible, but I let them be inaccessible. But then here comes the catch now. In higher topos theory, not every left exact localization of such a pre sheaf topos is the sheafification with respect to a Grotendieck topology. So Grotendieck topologies give us, give us uh, 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 left exact localizations, but there are more. Now, how about that? So we are, we are faced with a few questions. So given a small category, how do we describe all the left exact localizations of a pre sheaf topos? Or more generally, if we are given an infinity topos E, how do we describe all the left exact localizations of E? or uh, slightly reformulated, if I'm given a set S of maps in an infinity topos, how can I invert S in a left exact way? So I would like to describe the left exact localization generated by S. I know how, or we know for a long time how to localize with respect to S, but we, it's not clear how to left exact localize with respect to S, uh, at least. And then finally, uh, I, I, we, we need to, to say what is a sheaf with respect to S. And uh, we, we can answer all these questions. So I, I, the answer will come in, in a few steps. I will define a nested sequence of, of full subcategories of E. So given a set S of maps in an infinity topos E, I will first define the local objects with respect to S, then the modal objects with respect to S, and finally the sheaves with respect to S. And I will try to, to explain how all this works. So first, uh, so we are given a set of maps S in an infinity topos E, and then I call an object X in E, I call it S local. If for any map F in that set S, uh, pre-composing with this map induces a weak equivalence of these mapping spaces. So recall that in an infinity category, an infinity category always comes enriched over the category of spaces. So this map E is the mapping space, it's a, it's a space. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, pre-composing here with F. And if, if this is a weak equivalence for all the Fs in S, then I call X S local. This is an instance of orthogonality that Charles Resk uh, mentioned in his talk. So we basically, this is the condition saying that the map from X to the terminal object is right orthogonal to all the maps in S. 
Okay, and I will write log ES for the full subcategory of S local objects in E. And it's a, it's a fact that this uh, log ES is a presentable category and it's reflective in E. So reflective means that uh, the inclusion functor has a left adjoint and this left adjoint is the reflector, but sometimes I will just call it the localization slightly imprecisely. Okay, next I will tell you what are the modal objects. So an object X in an infinity topos E is called S modal. If it's local with respect to all the maps in S and all their base changes. So that's a, now a, 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 bigger, a bigger class of maps. And so, so modal objects are local with, with respect to, but they are local with respect to a slightly bigger or bigger class of, of maps. And I will say, or I will write mod ES for the full subcategory of S modal objects. And now it's true again that these modal objects are a presentable category and they are reflective in E. So why is that? Well, there is a trick. Um, in the definition of an infinity topos, uh, one always say, says that E is a presentable category. So presentable means that there is a choice of generators for that category. And if G is such a set of generators, so there is a choice of set of a generator of generators. And if G is a set of, of generators for E, then in the above definition, I don't need to take all the base changes of the maps in S, but only the base changes over the generators. So I'm taking my maps in S, and if the target of this, of this map in S is B, then I take all the maps from the objects in G to S, and I pull back along them. That gives me now a new set, because S is a set and G is a set. So now I have a new set, which is bigger, but it's still a set. And then the modal objects are the local objects with respect to this bigger set. Okay, so I need to now add base changes. Next, I need to define what is the diagonal of a map. So if uh, F is a map from A to B, then I pull it back again along itself. And then I have a little square and the diagonal, there is some other co-Cartesian, the, the, the Cartesian gap map of this, of this, little, of this little square. And then I need to define iterates of the diagonal. So the convention is that delta zero of F is F and then delta N of F is just the diagonal of the diagonal of the diagonal and so on. Example, if I take uh, the map from A to the terminal object then the diagonal of that map is just the diagonal of A, A to A times A. And the nth diagonal of that map is A mapping to A to the S N minus one. So for example, in spaces, this a to the s n minus one is just the, the, the functions from the sphere to a. And among them, you have the constant fun uh, functions. And uh, this a that maps the picks out exactly the constant functions. And then I can de uh, define the diagonal closure of this set s. So I take all the, the maps in s and then I add all their, all their higher uh, diagonals, their iterated diagonals. And I call this set delta infinity s, and I, I will call it the diagonal closure. So now I can give you our definition of sheaves. So s is a set of maps in an infinity topos, and now x in E is called an s sheaf if it is modal with respect to this diagonal closure of s. And the full subcategory of E given by the s sheaves is de denoted by sheaves es. And our main theorem is the following. The category of sheaves ES is presentable and reflective in E. And the reflector that goes from, from E to the sheaves in E is a left exact localization. In particular, the sheaves themselves form again an infinity topos. And L has the correct universal property that we would like it to have. It's initial among all the left exact and co-continuous functors that invert invert the maps in S. So left exact means it preserves finite limits and co-continuous means it commutes with all, with all co-limits. Okay. So in this way, we, this is the left exact localization generated by my set S of maps. 
And now I can define what is a higher site. So um, if I'm back in the case of a pre-shift topos, I, I take as, as generators the representable functors and I call RC the set of representable functors in this pre-shift topos. And then an infinity site is just a pair of, of a category C with a set S of maps in the, in the pre-sheaf topos. And then a sheaf with respect to this infinity site is just a pre-sheaf which is local with respect to all the RC base changes of the diagonal closure of S. So this is the recipe to get, to get sheaves. You take first your set S, you add all the higher diagonals, then you pull them back over your, your generators, in this case, the representable functors, and then you take the local objects. Now, th this definition is not exactly the definition that, that uh, Charles gave in his, in his lecture. In his lecture, he defined a higher side, but S in his case was just a set of monomorphisms. But here we have a, a general set of, of maps, and we can define uh, now the sheaves with respect to a general set of maps. And then we have the corollary that any infinity topos is equivalent to an infinity topos of sheaves of, on such an infinity site. Okay. Uh, I would like to, to now um, relate this notion of sheaf to the classical notion of sheaf. For that, I need the notion of a monomorphism. So a monomorphism is a map such that its, its diagonal is an isomorphism. An isomorphism here is to interpret it in the higher categorical context. So you would probably say a weak equivalence. Now, um, a monomorphism is the same as a minus one truncated map. It's just, a, it's just another name for that. And uh, in the category of spaces, a monomorphism is just the inclusion of, of a, a of a bunch of connected components into your space. And in the category of sets, a monomorphism is just an in injective, injective map. And uh, th there is this definition by, by Jacob Lurie. Um, so if your uh, left exact localization is generated by a set S, and this set S only consists of monomorphisms, then you call this localization topological. So a topological localization is a left exact localization that is generated by some monomorphisms. And then Charles Resk explained, uh, he sketched somehow why these localizations, these topological localizations of appreciative topos correspond exactly to the Grotendieck topologies on C. So these are the ones that, that we already know somehow. And um, so what is now the, the classical sheaf condition is just uh, somehow if you take a set of, of, of maps in an infinity topos that only consists of monomorphisms, then you don't, then somehow the first step that we took is to take the, the diagonal closure of your set S. But if you have monomorphisms, well, then the diagonal is an isomorphism and the higher diagonals are also isomorphisms. So what you add is just isomorphisms. You have your set S plus a bunch of isomorphisms. So those ones you don't need to invert anymore. They are already isomorphisms. So this means that in this case, the sheaves are exactly the same as the modal objects. The step of adding diagonals was unnecessary. And then our sheaf condition reduces exactly to the classical sheaf condition uh, given by Grotendieck topologies. Because now you have a set of, of monomorphisms. And when you take this, this um, step where you pull back over the generators, well, if you pull back a monomorphism, you end up with a monomorphism. Now you have monomorphisms with target the representable functors. This is what, what people call a SIF, right? This thing is now stable by base change because we just added all the base changes. So this is how you get a, a classical SIF. And the proof I just explained, yeah, if you have a monomorphism, then the diagonal is an isomorphism. Now in one top of theory, this is all there is. Every Lex localization is topological. So why is that? Well, if we take a map F from A to B in a one topos and we would like to invert it in a left exact way, how do we do it? Well, we factor it into a su subjection followed by a monomorphism. And then I start inverting the monomorphism. H 
here in the factorization and all its base changes. I need to add the base changes in order to make it left exact, the localization. But that's fine. So far, we are only inverting monomorphisms. And then in the next step, I need to invert the diagonal of F. Well, the, the, the image of the diagonal of F is the diagonal of the image because the localization induced by uh, inverting H is, is, is left exact. So now I invert the, the diagonal. Uh, and, and this makes then the, 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 the map F also a mono. So now it's, it's a subjection and a mono, and therefore it's an isomorphism. So this is the, the recipe to, to invert a map in a left exact way. But now comes the point, in a one category, the diagonal of any map is already a monomorphism. So if you do the next step, the second diagonal, it's an isomorphism. There is nothing anymore. This, this is all there is. You, you get away in a one topos to generate left exact localizations in a one topos, you get away by inverting only monomorphisms. Therefore, they are all topological. In higher topos theory, that's not the case. If you have a space and you take the map to the terminal object, then the diagonal of that map is the diagonal of A. So you go from A to A times A. And again, in spaces, yeah, you have, or in, in sets, you take, you, you can draw the, the, the square and then you can draw in the diagonal, it's a subset. But in, in the higher categorical context, this is not a sub-object. If it were a sub-object, all the fibers would vanish. But let's compute the fibers of this map. Well, in the higher categorical context, I need to compute not the, the strict fibers, I need to compute the homotopy fibers. And how do I do that? I need to replace my map, my diagonal, with a vibration. And one way of doing it, that is by replacing A by the path space. So now I have maps from the unit interval to A, and it has two loose ends, the unit interval, and I can evaluate at each one. And this gives me a map downstairs to A times A. This is a vibration, and this is the one that uh, replaces my diagonal. And then I calculate the fiber. So the general fiber at, an, at a point A comma B in the, in the product is now the maps, or sorry, the, the, the paths that start at A and end at B. Now, if A is equal to B, so if I take a point in the diagonal, in, well, then the fiber is a loop space, the loop space of A at the point A. And in general, in homotopy theory, they don't vanish. It's just a fact of life. They get into the way. Yeah, and, and so the diagonal of a, of a space is not a monomorphism. You cannot do the trick I just did in, in one category theory. You, you, you just, you have to add higher diagonals. So let me just see how many, how much time. Ah, I'm very fast. I'm very fast. Okay, so, so what is left? What is left? Uh, these are the, Lurie recognized this and he called them the co-topological localizations. They are the ones, the left exact localizations that invert no monomorphism at all. And uh, he also proved the, the theorem that um, any left exact localization in a, in, a, in a topos, in an infinity topos can be factored into a topological localization followed by a co-topological localization. And the, well, the topological localizations are the ones we somehow we know. I mean, for a long time, people know how how to, to deal and to handle uh, Grotendieck topologies and sheaves and things like that. But what, what are these co-topological localizations? I mean, maybe they are just an artifact of, of higher topos theory. What about them? Well, in fact, they are very important somehow. I'll give you an example. Let Finn denote the category of finite spaces. So these are the spaces whose homotopy type is equivalent to a finite CW complex. And then I take the, the category of functors, covariant functors from finite spaces to spaces. I, I, so we, we denote them by S a joint X because it has the universal property of a, of a polynomial ring. Yeah, but now our ground ring is the category of spaces somehow. It's the, the infinity topos generated by, by one object. And uh, in this, in this infinity topos, I can take evaluation at the terminal space or the one-point space. And this gives me a left exact localization. 
well, it also preserves all limits because evaluation preserves all limits, but I, that's not so important at the moment. I, I, I take evaluation at the point and I call it P0. P0, why? Because it's the zeroth level of the Goodwillie Tower. The Goodwillie Tower is supposed to be a, a Taylor a, a replacement of the Taylor series. And the local objects with respect to P0 are the constant functors. So like for any Taylor series, for any good Taylor series, the, the, the zeroth level is given by the constant things. And this localization P0, it has a, a non-trivial topological part, but it also has a non-trivial co-topological part. And uh, somehow this is somehow what, what forced us to consider co-topological localizations because in our, in our group, the four of us, we, we, we started because we wanted to, to, to understand the relation between Goodwillie calculus and higher topos theory. And then this observation, it forced us somehow to come to grips with co-topological localization. And then we started to understand how to generate left exact localizations and everything. And then somehow the point is, uh, that's in a forthcoming paper, is that Goodwillie calculus happens completely on the co-topological side somehow. So the fact that these co-topological localizations exist gives rise to the Goodwillie tower. And the Goodwillie really Tower, even though you might know, not know what it is, it doesn't matter. It's central to homotopy theory. So this, this is supposed to tell you that cotopological localizations are not something pathological. They are, in fact, central. And uh, let me just see. Maybe I have time. Maybe I, I don't explain this. Well, OK, this, this somehow. Um, this slide uh, illustrates how our theorem works. So if we want to generate this localization P0 according to our theorem, we can do it in the following way. We take X, well, this X, it, it can be identified with the functor, the, the inclusion of finite spaces to, to spaces. So it's the identity functor. And then I consider the map from X to the terminal functor, the functor that is constant the point. And this, the, uh, so these two functors, they are representable. The, the identity is representable at the terminal object and the terminal functor is representable by the empty space. And now we can, we can go through the list. What are the local, the modal objects and the sheaves? Well, the local objects are just the ones that, such that the, the map from the initial object to the terminal object are isomorphic. Okay, because you, you see, if you, if you map this, this map from x to, to the point to f, you use the Yoneda lemma, and then you get this this in, uh, this map from f to the to the of the empty set to f to the point, and being local forces you that this map is a is a is a weak equivalence. Okay, well that's maybe not so interesting. What are the modal objects? Well, now you can add base changes. So a base change of the map upstairs looks like this: x times a representable functor to a representable functor. The representable functors are now covariant. And a modal object now is just uh, a functor such that the value at k is the same as the value at k union a, a, a disjoint point. Okay, that's maybe also not so interesting. But now what are the sheaves? Well, now recall that in fact, the first step to, to generate sheaves is to add all the higher diagonals. Well, the diagonals, they look like this x to x to the sn minus 1. And x to the sn minus 1, again, is a representable functor. It's represented, representable in a, in, a, in a sphere. And now when you take base changes of those maps, you will realize that they give you, they are the Yoneda image of, of, of maps from, from a sphere to k. And the cofiber is gluing on a cell. Is gluing on an n cell, and any finite space is obtained in a finite wave from from gluing on these cells. So now a, a, a sheaf, an x sheaf, is a is a functor that sends that that doesn't distinguish between gluing on sheaves. So f of k and f of k with the gluing on cells, f of k with f of k glued on that n cell is just the same. So this means that all the values are the same. So the, the, the f is now a constant functor. So this means that p0 is generated by the single map from x to the point. 
And now our theorem is that the Goodwill tower is somehow just generated by taking higher joins of, of that object X somehow. What you do is you take, you take the, somehow the kernel of your, well, we call it a congruence class. That, that, so that's the map that I inverted by your localization, in this case, P0. And then you take higher powers of this thing, which is an ideal. You, you should think of this like an ideal of a ring. So now you take higher powers of that ideal and you divide it out. And what you get is the good tower. power. Uh, in fact, thank you very much. That's all. A lot, okay. I mean, you have, uh, <laughs> you have uh, really uh, uh, explained quite well. Uh, so are there questions from the audience? I mean, I guess I have a you know a general question, a more philosophical. I mean, I understand very well that you want to pass to spaces and so on and so forth. But I mean, wh what is really the origin of infinity toposes? I mean, in that, uh, in that, uh, I mean, I mean, in a very general, broad uh, philosophical sense. I mean, well. Um, the fact is that that uh, somehow these functors from finite spaces to spaces it's it's just an infinity topos right you mean this is this is a basic example you mean that, 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 i mean for, for for me i mean the, the basic example is maybe the category of spaces itself that's an infinity topos. okay and mm -hmm. then let me say it like this so but I, I'm sorry, I mean, when you talk about the category of spaces, you mean, for instance, simplicial sets or what? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. the it, well, I mean, the infinity category associated to, for okay. example, simplicial sets. Yeah, okay, 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 yeah, so as that, an infinity that, category, okay, yes. why I can't localization, sure, uh, okay, that's. fine, okay, and uh, so spaces and uh, infinity, let's let's say coke co-complete infinity categories, you can think of them as the, the modules over spaces. So spaces are now thought of as a ring. Yeah, okay, the, fine, fine, that's perfectly good, yes, yeah. And the co-continuous, sorry, the co-complete infinity categories are now like the modules. Okay. And the infinity topoi are like S algebras. They are like the algebras the, in, uh -huh. in, in, okay. in okay. the world. And then uh -huh. somehow... But... Mm, Yes. Wait, wait a second. I mean, um, I mean, if I if I take the, the, the analogy with gamma sets, uh, where I don't have spaces, but I have just sets. I mean, okay. Yeah. So um, Ga gamma, yeah, ga gamma, gamma spaces. So there, the, the source category is a is a is a one category, right? It's just pointed pointed sets, or the opposite of pointed sets. Just point finite. Yes, let's say that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and uh, in this case, you don't have co-topological localizations. No, 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 of course not. No. Yeah, so th there, there are still, of course, topological localizations somehow. But uh, what, what we want is we, we, we want, uh, we want a, a finite space. So if you, if you take functors, covariant functors from finite pointed sets to spaces, you can left can extend them to all spaces. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Certainly. And then you get functors that are they are called um, how do you call them? Maybe strongly finitary. They commute with all sifted colimits. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's that's it's a nice class of functors, but it's it's a bit restrictive when you take finite spaces as your source category and you left can extend. These are now finitary functors. These are the ones that commute with filtered columns, not mm -hmm. with all sifted columns, only with the filtered columns. Mm -hmm. And this is somehow the place where, where good really calculus happens. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then you can yeah. think of that really just as, as, a, as a ring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, as the analog of a ring, yes, yes. And, and here, somehow we, 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 can give, we can give this interpretation. In fact, we have a, a more general uh, um, construction, which we call the Nilpotence Tower. 
which we are still about, uh, it's in the forthcoming paper. It's not yet on mm -hmm. the archive. Mm -hmm. So you take any infinity topos and any left exact localization. Uh -huh. And to this data, you can associate a tower of left exact localization. I see, which is like the Goodwillie Tower. I mean. Which is like the Goodwillie Tower, exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. And okay. the Goodwillie Tower is, a, is an example, as is the orthogonal tower by Weiss. Mm -hmm. And there's also a unitary tower by Nile. They are all examples of that. Ah, well, that's very good, yeah. Okay, so thank, thank you, you and bye-bye. Thank you very much.